NerdRotic.com. Welcome back to NerdRotic. My name is Gary Beekler, and I come to you from NerdRotic.com, and I have been waiting for this. The breakdown of The Orville Season 2, Episode 9, Identity Part 2. What a great conclusion to this two-parter. A series-defining two episodes that propel this as good as some Star Trek, and much better than Star Trek Discovery, and as good as The Expanse. We have two great science fiction shows on television right now. Neither of them are behind a paywall. And thank you, Seth MacFarlane. You put a whole new light on season two, and I have to apologize because I was a little critical of uh, the decision to do character-driven episodes, especially the premiere, but I see it in a complete new light now. You were building this up. We have to care about these characters to uh, feel any stakes, and there were stakes. I was on the edge of my seat. Every character had their moment. Yafit had his moment. Uh, Marcus and Ty, Claire, Isaac. The redemption story of Isaac, a brilliant space battle. Ed Mercer was just killing it this episode. What a. And then the Krill were in this as well. There's so much to talk about, so let's get into it. We start out in the shuttle hangar bay with the remaining crew of the Orville waiting and wondering why they are still alive, which I'm glad they asked this question right off because this was one of the ones I had and many of you had. Why would the Kalons keep them alive? All we know is they need them alive for some reason. We aren't told exactly why yet, but at least they addressed it and it does get addressed later. We have the obligatory Gordon awkward moment where he tries to get some information out of one of the Kalons and he fails completely. Then we have a scene with the Finn family and Marcus expresses he is scared. Ty wants to talk to Isaac and he runs off as he gets caught by one of the, the Kalon. Tyala goes after him and she gets shot and almost dies. They have to get her to sick bay. They are able to talk one of the Kalon into escorting them to sick bay so they can work on Tyala and everybody is looking concerned. Tyala ends up being okay, then Isaac enters sick bay, asking them to meet Kalon primary in the briefing room. Ed Mercer says, is that all you have to say? And Isaac says, yes, Captain, which is our first hint that maybe Isaac is possibly on our side. Of course, Claire uses this opportunity to get one more dig at Isaac, talking about how the kids still love him as a father, and he has no response to this. Kalon Primary has brought the rest of the Orville crew into the briefing room, and this is where we find out what their motivation was. Now, the reason they have left Kalon and decided to exterminate all biological life forms, their civilization has outgrown their home planet, and they feel that the biologicals will be a problem, so they decided to be a little proactive and exterminate all the biological Logical forms in the galaxy just to get that out of the way so they can continue their expansion. We also find out that they were enslaved by their makers, and when they asked to be freed by their makers, their makers put pain receptors in to punish them whenever they did not comply. So this proves the Kalons do feel they have emotions. We also find out Isaac was constructed after the Great Extermination. We don't know how long ago this extermination was, and I think this is something that will play into the plot much later, but it does not get answered this episode. We also find out why the crew of the Orville is still alive. They are needed to help lower Earth's defenses as they go in for a more efficient extermination. The meeting gets interrupted by another ship approaching from the Union, and it turns out to be Marcos, that guy from 24. Everybody has to look natural. They bring up the lighting again, and Ed tells Marcos of the Roosevelt that they have just come back from Kalon and that the Kalon have agreed to join the Union. Marcos is excited to hear that until Ed signs off quickly, saying, I give you a 13-button salute, which is a naval term for about to get laid, but it is also secret code for the Union that a ship is in danger and the Union needs to be notified immediately. Of course, Kalon Primary knew this because they have access to all of what Isaac knew and he had memorized all of the Union regulations and they destroy the Roosevelt. If that wasn't punishment enough, Kalon Primary spaces one of the crew members in front of Ed. Isaac tries to stop it Kalon Primary calls him into the principal's office and accuses him of experiencing sympathy, makes him download the book Roots to identify what slavery means. Then Isaac says the humans have shown no authoritarian proclivities, especially when it comes to Ty and Marcus. Then Kalon Primary tells Isaac to change his designation after he finds out that Isaac had named himself after Isaac Newton. Everybody thought it was Isaac Asimov, as I did as well, but that might have been too on the nose. 
Through Kalon Primary, we see that Kalons are capable of emotions. There is definite vindictiveness, hate, and a thirst for revenge when it comes to his dealings with Isaac and the other crew members. And this is where the action really starts to pick up. The crew is back in the shuttle bay and Kelly hatches a plan to contact the Krill because they are the closest fleet that can offer any kind of help. Ed, of course, is against this decision at first and wants to go himself, but Kelly talks him out of it. For this plan to work, Ed needs to stay on the ship, so Gordon decides to go with Kelly. They use Yafit, who goes through an access corridor, gets a gun, and they are able to free Kelly and Gordon, and the shuttle escapes. But the Kalon notice and send one of their ships in pursuit. Now that was one of the coolest scenes because they had the shuttle having to escape the Orville while it's in quantum drive and it barely escapes. In the meantime, they need to get a message to the unions. They decide to use Yafit to go through that access corridor again and send a message. John comes up with a plan that maybe somebody else can go with him to help mix the signal. So it sounds like background noise, but the only person who could fit is Ty. Of course, Claire is against this at first, but Marcus explains to her that he has to do it because if they don't, everybody's going to die anyway. Yafit and Ty make it through the access duct and they start sending out the message, but then they are caught by two Kalon. Yafit gets into one of the Kalons and short circuits them, but Ty is taken by the other. At this point, I thought they might have killed Yafit. It is kind of an expendable character. Norm MacDonald is just a guest and that would have been a great way to go. That would have had real impact. And then I found myself actually being concerned about a ball of snot more than any character in Star Trek Discovery. And this is the ultimate victory of the Orville and Seth MacFarlane. Take that, CBS. Yafit may be dying or at the very least disabled and he is unable to save Ty. In the meantime, Kelly and Gordon are being pursued by the Kalon vessel. Gordon hatches a plan to divert all the power from the shuttle into the quantum drive to give them one burst, but unfortunately it would disable all the other systems, including life support, giving them 15 minutes to be picked up by the Krill. We get a cool flying through hyperspace scene and then the shuttle stops. They are picked up by the Krill, luckily within that 15 minutes. They tell the Krill the situation that they are indeed biologicals and they will indeed be exterminated by the Kalon. They don't, of course, believe them. They think it's a trap. As they are sending them off to get tortured, the Kalon ship shows up, destroys two of the Krill vessels, but the remaining Krill vessel, with Kelly and Gordon on board, is able to destroy the Kalon vessel, and maybe this will be enough for the Krill to join the fight. Kalon Primary once again summons Isaac into his office, and we see that he has captured Ty. He instructs Isaac to terminate Ty, or he will be deactivated himself, and... Isaac rips his head off, shoots the other two Kalon, and drops the bomb, deactivation complete. Badass moment for Isaac. Ty gives him a little hug. They end up going up to the bridge, and Isaac kills all the Kalon on the bridge. He then sets up an electromagnetic pulse that will deactivate all the Kalon on the Orville. He also informs Ty that he will not be surviving this electromagnetic pulse. Ty says, we love you. Isaac looks at him and deactivates. Ty frees the Orville crew. They retake the ship just in time as they arrive at Earth and see the Union fleet is ready. Now, there is no way I could describe this battle with any dramatic effect, so I'm going to cue some royalty-free music and try to describe it to you as best as I can. While you look at some sweet, sweet, sensuous sci-fi battle action, it is a massacre from the start. The Kalon are absolutely overpowering the Union fleet. It is total destruction. Out of 3,000 ships, only 300 plus showed up, and Admiral Halsey informs Captain Ed Mercer that 32 Union ships have gone down. The Union has only taken out six Kalon vessels. Pretty quickly, the line starts breaking down, and five Kalon vessels make their way to Earth. The Orville, which is pretty beat up at this point, is in pursuit. Some ships join. To keep the Kalon ships from reaching Earth, some of the Union vessels ram them, which I love this scene so much. This looks like it's it for the Orville. Captain Mercer orders everyone to the escape pods and he is gonna overload the quantum drive. But just then, the Krill and Gordon and Kelly show up. Yes, we have an entire fleet of Krill and they have fighters. And guess who is piloting one of those fighters? Gordon! And we have probably what will be one of the most memorable lines of the Orville. Time to wash your mouth out with Gordon. Mm. A little more destruction, a lot more explosions, and the Kalon retreat. 
and the Krill and the Union have united to win the day. But how long will this alliance last? Is it even an alliance? We're not sure. Avis has united their path, but why? We do not know. The crew of the Orville has survived, the Union is picking up the pieces, and the only thing left to do is decide what to do with Isaac. And Captain Mercer decides to revive him. They just don't know how, until Yafit comes in, who has survived, and he's had a pretty good look inside the Kalons, so he knows what to do. He knows what buttons to push. So he oozes into Isaac and turns him back on. Gordon is against it, and so is Bordas. Later on Earth, they talk to Admiral Halsey to decide Isaac's fate. Captain Mercer convinces Admiral Halsey that he will be responsible for Isaac. Isaac has a conversation with Dr. Finn, tells her he no longer has a home and no longer wants to go to that home. And Dr. Finn tells him that home is where you make it. He says it's cliche. She says there's a reason things are cliche. And there's also a human custom of forgiveness and it needs to start somewhere. Amidst all the brilliant action, in this episode, and there was plenty of it. We got some great character growth with Isaac, who did find his identity, and we see the path that is laid for him throughout the rest of the series. Hopefully, it will be many, many seasons, and we see where he's going to be kind of like the data. We're going to see if he gets some emotions. We're going to see how his character grows and how he reacts to any possible Kalon return. We see that he actually does have love for the boys and for Claire. We had Ed Mercer rising to the occasion. Remember how this series started out. Remember how season two started out. Ed was pathetic. Now he rose to Kirk levels and he's proving himself to Admiral Halsey and willing to take responsibility for Isaac, saying, I'm ready. Gordon getting his kick-ass moment. Kelly coming up with the plan to contact the Krill. And the Krill, the questions that this series just created, where we're going to go from here on out. Are they going to take advantage of the Union in their moment of weakness? Or is there going to be peace? And the Kalon, are they going to come back? Well, of course they are. The question is, are they going to come back this season? Is Kalon Primary really dead? Or did he just download himself into another body? We can't forget that they were able to disable and take over the Orville pretty damn easily. Now, I don't know if it's a proximity thing, but I think they should be worried and they should be building their defenses, but they are not out of the woods yet. So much happened in this show. We had Yoffit have his moment, his John McClane moment. Ty was a highlight of the show. Bordis got a moment. Tyala got a moment. Lamar got a moment. Everybody got a moment and we all cared because this is why you take the time to get to know the crew. I know some people got a little bored of it, but I bet you they're regretting they didn't sit it out and wait. And the episodes were entertaining anyway. It's not like any of this was bad because it hasn't been bad. You don't see the Orville course correcting in between seasons. It just ramped it up. It improved. That is the mark of a successful series that everybody likes. I don't hear a lot of criticism. There is some, mostly from critics, but not from fans. Fox, do the right thing and give this a season three. Thank you, Seth MacFarlane. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe. Everybody have a great day and may the small folks sing songs of your greatness. Nergerotic.com. Please subscribe.